Okay, this is starting uh, Microbiology Chapter 5. This is Part A of Chapter 5. I believe there's a Part A and Part B that will be listed for you uh, here in summary. What we're going to talk about first today is micro microbial metabolism. And you'll see, again, some similarities between microorganisms and the human cell. Some of you are familiar, very familiar with metabolism in the human cell. Those of you who have already had A&P Part 1 familiar with metabolism, those of you who are taking A&P Part 1 now uh, are in the process of going through metabolism. I know some aspects of it we tested on actually today. But we'll go through some of the definitions for you. And then I'll expect you to do some of the reading uh, in your textbook, which goes over this in much more detail. Metabolism is basically the sum of the chemical reactions in an organism. Catabolism is the energy releasing processes that we see going on in microorganisms. Again, very similar to what we see going on in human cells as well. Catabolism releases energy stored in organic molecules and yields energy. Anabolism is the energy using processes and anabolism is a combination of basically simple substances being formed into complex substances and this process typically requires energy and we'll talk about some of the processes through which energy is produced inside of these organisms. Catabolism provides the building blocks for energy for anabolism as you can see on the illustration here before you Catabolic reactions transfer energy in complex molecules. Those complex molecules are referred to as ATP. There are a number of processes, chemical reactions, that involve enzymes that allow the production of ATP to take place within microorganisms and within the human cells themselves. Again, there's a significant amount of overlap when we talk about metabolism between those two uh, types of cells. Now, there are metabolic pathways. Metabolic pathways are basically a sequence of enzymatically catalyzed chemical reactions that take place in a cell or inside a microorganism. These metabolic pathways are determined by enzymes. We'll go into a lot more detail about enzymes uh, during this lecture. Enzymes are basically types of proteins. They're encoded by specific genes uh, in our system. Now, enzymes are proteins that function as a catalyst, substances that will speed up reactions without themselves being changed or without themselves being used up. Basically, there's a level of energy, an activation energy level that's required to make certain reactions take place. What enzymes do is they lower that level of activation energy that's required for specific reactions to take place. Uh, an enzyme has a three-dimensional structure. It has an active site that reacts with the surface of a substrate. A substrate is basically a substance that's going to be acted on. And then enzymes are generally named after the substrate that they react with or the type of reaction that they perform. You typically want to look at the suffix of that word. A-S-E typically indicates this is an enzyme or protein that's used as an enzyme. The example uh, that your text gives is dehydrogenase oxidase, dehydrogenase are basically enzymes that help remove hydrogen. Oxidases are basically enzymes that help add oxygen. And we'll see these types of reactions take place within uh, various organisms and again within the uh, human cells as well. There's a theory that's out referred to as the collision theory. It states that chemical reactions can occur when atoms, ions, and molecules collide. Now, early on when we talked about chemical structures, and again, those of you who have had A and P1 and those of you, you who are taking A and P1 now have already studied this chemical organization at a cellular level. We know in the human body, the human body is basically a series of atoms that join together to make molecules. Molecules join together to make tissue structures. Tissue structures lead to tissues, lead to organs, so forth and so on. In a cell or in a microorganism, specific microorganism, the same process takes place. These organisms are developed from an anatomical level and then ions, uh, then at these atoms join together to form molecules which will form the cellular units. But inside the cell there are also a series of chemical reactions that take place at an anatomical level. 
also involving ions. Again, in anatomy, we've discussed ions such as sodium, potassium, chloride. Uh, <clears throat> and so we've also talked about complex structures such as carbohydrates, proteins, and lipids. And this similarly are the structures that we also deal with when we talk about microorganisms. And so when we look at the chemical reactions that are involved in metabolism, it also involves these same structures, atoms, ions, and molecules, but they must collide. They collide and react. So the basis of the collision theory is that atoms, ions, molecules are continuously moving, continuously colliding. The energy transfer from this reaction disrupts bonds breaking them and allowing new bonds to form. Activation energy is needed to disrupt electron configurations. Again, um, if you remember from this basic chemistry, atoms have basically an electron cloud, an orbit through which electrons will be orbiting. And it is the sharing of electrons that allow these different atoms to be able to combine. But again, these reactions take place because these atoms are bouncing around all the time. They collide and create uh, reactions. Reaction rate is basically the frequency of collisions with enough energy to bring about a reaction. Reaction rate can be increased by uh, enzymes or by increasing the temperature or the pressure. So when you increase the temperature inside a particular solution or for a particular reaction, you increase the temperature, you actually activate these molecules to move around faster. The more, the uh, faster these molecules move, the, it increases the number of opportunities that these collisions or these reactions can take place. You can also increase the pressure. If you have a, a volume of air or a volume of the solution, you add pressure, you push the molecules closer together, and reactions will take place faster in those settings. This is basically an illustration, again from your textbook, that shows the importance of, of enzymes. This would typically be the activation energy, the amount of energy that would be required for a particular reaction to take place. But if you add an enzyme, if you add a substance that helps to facilitate this reaction, it brings the activation energy level down to a much lower area. So again, enzymes help decrease the threshold or the requirement of energy and facilitate reactions to take place and they do this without themselves being used up in the reaction. Biological catalysts, these are specific for chemical reactions, they're not used up in the reaction. There are also substances referred to as apoenzymes or apoenzymes, basically proteins, still just as enzymes are proteins. They are inactive without cofactors and cofactors are basically non-protein components that are required. And we'll talk about some different examples of cofactors uh, in, in, uh, later on in the lecture. But cofactors may be metal ions such as iron that we use in our system to help us to be able to carry oxygen in uh, our red blood cells or other organic molecules. When they're organic molecules, these cofactors are referred to as coenzymes and coenzymes, again, are organic cofactors, organic such as carbohydrates, protein, lipids, organic substances. Carbon-based substances typically are made up of coenzymes. And then there are holy enzymes. I didn't make up these names. They include apoenzymes. Apoenzymes is described above. Are proteins that are inactive without cofactors. And then there is the cofactor, again, which would activate the, the uh, apoenzyme. Now, the substrate, this is typically what the enzyme is acting upon. A substrate is basically a substance that's acted upon by an enzyme. The substrate surface contacts the specific region on the enzyme molecule at an active site, and I'm going to show you this in an illustration, and it forms an intermediate enzyme substrate complex. Now the substrate is then transformed by breakdown of the molecule or in combination with other substrate molecules. The enzyme is then freed, unchanged, and is allowed to be able to react or to bond to other substrates that may be in the system. This illustration is out of your book. It shows an apoenzyme, which basically is a protein portion that's inactive. Then the cofactor comes in, which will also bind to this apoenzyme and cause it to be activated. 
then becomes a holoenzyme or a whole enzyme as the name refers and now the substrate can bind to this enzyme or this holoenzyme at an active site. Now if you noticed in the first illustration what happens this substrate you see the shape of the substrate it would not be able to bind with the apoenzyme because the active site is different it's like pieces of a puzzle but once the cofactor the coenzyme binds at this point to form the holoenzyme it changes the shape of the enzyme and now the substrate can fit just like a perfect piece of the puzzle to make the reaction take place so cofactors also will help change the, the, uh, the uh, appearance uh, of the enzyme by binding and once that occurs it's the enzyme is now allowed to bind with the substrate again to facilitate the reaction many coenzymes are derived from vitamins two important vitamins are nicotinamide uh, we see that in the form of NAD and NADP NADP is a phosphorylated form of NAD nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide um, another type of coenzyme is FMN which is flavin mononucleotide uh, and again combines with FAD which flavin adenine dinucleotide these are derivatives of uh, the B vitamin riboflavin they are also dehydrogenases so you will see they'll help to release hydrogen from various reactions and we'll talk about those in just a little bit so these are just some examples of coenzymes again coenzymes derived from vitamin the vitamin is vitamin B examples NAD, NADP, FMN, flavin, mononucleotide and FAD are examples of uh, coenzymes these are, again are derivatives of uh, the vitamin B coenzyme A this is a term that you'll see quite frequently in many of the reactions that we talk about derivative of vitamin B uh, you also see coenzyme A it's important in the reaction in the Krebs cycle the Krebs cycle also referred to as a citric acid cycle uh, many of you may be familiar with that if you've had other biology courses or even uh, in high school courses the Krebs cycle is an important cycle that takes place inside the cell specifically inside the mitochondria of the cell to allow the production of uh, ATP from carbon based substances the primary example we use in the Krebs cycle are carbohydrates six carbon sugars broken down brought into the cell broken down into three carbon sugars in the cytoplasm or the cytosol of the cell the three carbon sugars then brought into the mitochondria the mitochondria will will then process this through a series of enzymatic reactions known as the Krebs cycle to generate ATP ATP is a essential energy source for cellular reactions that require energy now there is a turnover rate or a turnover number this is basically the number of molecules that are, are or can be metabolized by an enzyme molecule per second now remember as I talk about this relatively slowly these reactions take place at an incredible rate throughout our body 24 hours a day seven days a week cellular metabolism inside the body is essentially important for the human body to exist and microorganisms even though we're dealing sometimes with just one cell to organisms that turnover rate is equally important and similar enzymatic reactions are required at a microscopic level in microorganisms for these organisms to survive so typically when we talk about turnover number generally we're talking about one to ten thousand molecules per second that are going on in an organism at any one period of time these same types of reactions this illustration again out of your textbook showing the uh, enzyme the active site where the substrate will bind forming the enzyme substrate complex this would be then the product that's produced once the enzyme is involved in the reaction uh, and then this product is utilized in the body or in the cellular organism the micro uh, organism uh, in whatever way that particular reaction is supposed to be carried out your textbook also helps to classify various types of enzymes as you can see these are just uh, just an overview of the types of enzymes that are available in the microorganism uh, again 
The suffix ASE is noted in each one of these. Oxidoreductases, oxidation reduction reactions, which we'll talk about in just a little bit. Transferase, which is basically the transfer of functional groups. Uh, hydrolases, hydrolysis, uh, lyase, which is basically the removal of atoms without hydrolysis or the release of hydrogen or water. Uh, isomerase is basically the rearrangement of atoms that we'll see and we'll talk about that when we talk about DNA structures. And ligase is the joining of molecules that use ATP. I am not so focused on you knowing specifically what each of these reactions do. I would expect you to recognize an enzyme based on that suffix, oxidase, transferase, hydrol... Uh, now there are some that I, obviously, and I'll point those out to you, that I would expect you to know what their, their particular function is, but this list was basically given to you just so you can appreciate the term of an enzyme, the ASE, and its responsibility inside a particular uh, uh, microorganism to carry out reactions. Now, enzymes can be denatured or changed. Typically the things that can denature an enzyme, temperature and pH. Temperature above a certain level or below a certain level, pH either acidic or basic, alkaline. Uh, most of you are familiar with those terms. If not, the text gives you some reading. Uh, to be able to discern pH. Now obviously in the human body our pH is within a specific range 7.35 to 7.45. Now if we change the pH of our body if we change the pH at a cellular level we alter the pH, we alter the, the ability for enzymes to function. If we alter the ability for enzymes to function the body stops working. That's the human body, multiple cells working together. For a microorganism, the principle is the same. If you change the pH environment which the organism lives, if you change the pH, the organism will not survive because it can no longer produce energy because it requires enzymes to carry out these enzymatic reactions that are required to carry out the life essential processes of the microorganism. If you change the temperature, you change the ability, you, ch you denature the enzyme, and thus the microorganism may not survive. We'll talk later today about various microorganisms. Some of these microorganisms can live at extreme temperatures. Temperatures that we could not survive at, many microorganisms can. Same thing applies for temperature pHs. There are a number of various types of organisms that can live in extreme pHs, pHs that our body would not be able to survive in. And so you'll need to keep that important. I bring that up because especially those of you who will be working in hospital settings, we kind of get lulled into this false sense of security that you put, a, you put food in a refrigerator, you expect the food to be able to last for prolonged periods of time. Now it doesn't mean that microorganisms won't grow. I mean, obviously, I'm, I'm sure you've kept food in the refrigerator long enough that you begin to see things growing on it. Microorganisms like fungi will begin to grow. Bacteria will begin to go, even though you have these foods refrigerated. So there are certain bacteria that can live in these temperature extremes. There are bacteria that live in the hot springs. And so temperature extremes uh, uh, affect certain microorganisms, but some or microorganisms can flourish in those types of extremes. Uh, getting back to uh, factors that influence enzyme activity though, uh, temperature, for example, the illustration in your book gives you an in illustration demonstrating to you enzyme activity in temperature extreme. As the temperature increases, you'll see a peak in enzymatic activity. There is obviously an optimum level by which a microorganism would function. And then obviously as temperature extremes go on the other end, here being very cold and now here being very hot. Temperature extremes on each end will obviously affect the enzymatic reactions of a microorganism. Thus you will affect the growth of microorganisms. Let me digress just for a moment to explain why we go through all of this. We're talking about microorganisms, so don't forget we're microbiology, so we may make some references or I may make some references to the human body. But we're talking about microorganisms. Later on in the semester, we're going to talk about specifically microorganisms that cause disease in the human body. We want to know how we can control the growth of microorganisms that attack the human body. One of the ways we can do that is affecting the environment which these microorganisms live.
One way is by manipulating the temperature. If we make it too hot, sterilization procedures where you take an instrument that's going to be used in surgery, you put it in a hot oven called an autoclave, you sterilize it. This temperature extreme kills all microorganisms. It kills the enzymatic activity of those microorganisms and gets rid of them. Temperature extremes such as coal will help to preserve certain medications and prevent bacterial growth from developing. And so it's important for you to understand these concepts. Why do you use refrigeration? Why do we use temperature extreme? Because we denature the enzymes in these microorganisms. Enzymatic activity can no longer take place in the microorganism and then it will die. And so if we can manipulate that even in the human body or in the foods that we eat or in the medications that we use in a clinical setting, then we can in, indeed uh, affect the growth of microorganisms. So there are also the uh, factor of pH. Again, you can see the extremes, a highly acidic environment. There is low enzymatic activity. There is an optimum level that will occur here in microorganisms, but then as we see, pH extremes go to a more alkaline or basic type of a pH, then we also see decrease in the enzymatic activity. Also substrate concentration. Now remember, substrate is the product that the enzyme will be binding to. You can saturate an enzyme by adding a lot of uh, substrate. You only have so much enzyme doesn't matter, there is a saturation point at which every active site on every enzyme will be taken up. And so you can continue to add as much substrate as you want to, you will not increase the number of reactions that take place because you've saturated, you've saturated the uh, active site. So this is uh, the factor of substrate concentration. You can quickly flatten out or plateau the number of reactions that occur by increasingly adding substrate uh, to the reaction until all the active sites on the enzyme. And so your rate limiting step here is the availability of the enzyme. If all the enzymes are tied up and these reactions can't take place, uh, you have subsequently uh, now decreased and increased in the reaction by loading these uh, reactions with substrate. Now, there are a couple of other concepts that you need to pick up from uh, this process of enzymes and enzymes binding to substrates. One of the concepts is competitive inhibition, competitive inhibition. There are active sites on the enzymes where substrates will be binding. However, there may be other substances that can also bind at the same active site. When this occurs, it's called a competition two substances are trying to get to the same site. Now unfortunately, the competitive inhibitor may not be able to allow the reaction to take place because it's got to bind with the substrate. So a competitive inhibitor can actually block the enzyme and thus affect the enzymatic steps that may be required in the energy producing processes in microorganisms or in cells. So competitive inhibition may be a bad thing. An example would be the red blood cell binds to uh, oxygen. Now if you inhale carbon monoxide, carbon monoxide has a stronger affinity to red blood cells. And so there is a competition between oxygen and carbon monoxide, and carbon monoxide will win, but we can't live off of carbon monoxide. So for the human body, this competition, this carbon monoxide will con uh, competitively inhibit the binding of oxygen and thus that would be detrimental to the human system. When we talk about a mic uh, microorganism, you can see how competitive inhibition may indeed affect the uh, ability of a particular substrate to bind to an active site. Non-competitive inhibition basically the substrate will bind to another area of the enzyme. When this um, other substance, when this non-competitive inhibitor binds to the enzyme, it changes the shape of the enzyme, thus changing the shape of the active site. As you can see here in the illustration, again from your book, this is a substrate. It binds to the active site on the enzyme when it binds to the active site on the enzyme, the reaction takes place. 
add a, com a non-competitive inhibitor, it will bind at a different location on the enzyme. It changes the shape of the enzyme, thus changing the shape of the active site. And so now, the piece of the puzzle can no longer fit into the active site, and thus this will affect the enzymatic activity that we see in this particular reaction. Now in some metabolic reactions, several steps are required. Many instances, the final product can inhibit the enzymatic activity at some step to prevent uh, the, uh, the reaction or the reactants from making too much of an end product. This is called feedback inhibition. So again, what happens, the enzyme and the substrate will bind and they make an end product, but the end product in this enzymatic reaction will actually feed back and tell this enzymatic reaction to shut off. Again, it's the end product making too much of the end product shutting off the reaction. Your book gives an illustration of a feedback mechanism. Again, pathway where we'll see the substrate will bind. When the substrate binds and forms an intermediate product, it's this intermediate product this in, which leads to the end product, which again will feed back to the enzyme. This feedback substance or the feedback mechanism binds to an allosteric site. So this is a form of non-competitive inhibition this allosteric site and prevent the substrate from binding to more enzyme. And so now the enzymatic reaction is shut off because of feedback inhibition. Now in the human body, a number of different organ systems work this way. Thyroid gland, for example. In the thyroid gland, we produce a substance called thyroxin and thyronin. These substances, once they produce, enter into the bloodstream, but once it hits a certain level, it will begin to bind with the enzymes that are a part of that reaction and it simply tells the thyroid gland to shut off and not to produce any more thyroxin or thyronin. And so you have feedback inhibition in the human body. The same types of systems also take place within microorganisms as well. Now there's another structure referred to as ribozymes. They function as an enzyme like catalyst and they act on RNA. RNA is in the nucleus. We'll talk a little bit about the nucleus coming up, but it reacts to strands of RNA by removing sections or splicing RNA. RNA is a part of our genetic makeup inside the cell. RNA that cuts or splices the RNA basically uh, are the types of uh, structures that function, again, enzyme-like catalysts that affect pieces of RNA. Now, some of the types of reactions that we'll see enzymes used in oxidation reduction reactions for example. Oxidation is the addition of oxygen, more generally the removal of electrons or hydrogen ions. Because hydrogen ions are lost, most biological reactions are called dehydrogenation reactions. When a compound gains electrons or hydrogen atoms or loses oxygen, it is considered to be reduced, thus the term reduction. Oxidation and reduction in the cell are always coupled, so when you see an oxidation reaction, you know there's a reduction reaction that will take place. One substance basically is oxidized while another substance is reduced, thus the reaction is referred to as oxidation re uh, reduction or a redox reaction. Uh, these reactions typically are energy producing, and I'll give you an example or some examples of that later on in the lecture. Highly reduced compounds such as glucose with many hydrogen atoms contain potential energy. And you'll see how this potential energy is used in the Krebs cycle again later on in the lecture today. Again, summary, oxidation reduction reaction, oxidation, removal of electrons, reduction, the gain of electrons, redux reaction is an oxidation reaction that's paired with a reduction reaction. And again, this illustration is taken from your text. Now, in the biological system, electrons are often associated with hydrogen atoms. Biological oxidations are often referred to as dehydrogenation. Now, you can see the importance, and I've referred to NAD as a coenzyme earlier in a redux reaction. You can see how the NAD is used as a coenzyme. Again, an organic molecule 
may include two hydrogen atoms, NAD combines an oxidized organic molecule produced in this uh, portion of the reaction leading to reduction and you'll see the release of the hydrogen ion also referred to as the proton pump because it's positively charged but you'll see the release of uh, hydrogen that is the reduction portion of the reaction again redux reactions typically reduction and oxidation being coupled in reactions so why is this important again we have to get to the production of ATP ATP in the human system important ATP in a microorganism important as well especially if this is the energy source so the energy from oxidation and reduction uh, reactions is used to form ATP, ATP adenosine triphosphate that's the important energy packet in the cellular microorganism structures. The addition of a phosphate group is called phosphorylation. It's another term you need to be familiar with. Oxidative phosphorylation basically uh, leads to electrons being removed from organic compounds. They're transferred in sequence down a chain, a chain referred to as the electron transport chain to an electron acceptor such as oxygen and to another suitable compound which releases energy in the process. Now I'll show you some illustrations of the electron transport chain. It's a series, a sequence of reactions as well similar to but not the same as this process of the citric acid cycle or the Krebs cycle. It's similar to the Krebs cycle but uniquely different and we'll go through that. You'll see transfer of energy will take place in these as well. The energy that's used to make ATP from ADP, adenosine triphosphate, adenosine diphosphate, by adding a phosphate group generates this energy. Now, because it involves a substrate, because it involves phosphorylation, referred to as substrate level phosphorylation, no oxygen or inorganic final electron acceptor is required. So that electron transport chain to be able to transport energy that I talked about is not used in a biological system per se. ATP is generated by direct transfer of high energy phosphate from an intermediate metabolic compound such as adenosine diphosphate. And that's what we see in our biological system. But again, I'll show you some examples where the electron transport chain, which is another se sequence of chemical reactions, will take place also to help produce energy. Now, photophosphorylation, photo tells you it involves light in this process. This is another mechanism. Photophosphorylation occurs in photosynthetic cells. Obviously, we're not photosynthetic creatures, and so we don't use this process but light basically liberates the electron in chlorophyll. Chlorophyll you're probably familiar with from high school studies or other biological courses. Chlorophyll uh, actually will help to liberate uh, the electrons. We'll see electrons will pass down a, this electron transport chain uh, that I alluded to er earlier which will form ATP. This is just another process by which microorganisms that contain chlorophyll can also produce energy. ATP is basically generated just in summary from phosphorylation process the combining of another phosphate group to ATP again adenosine diphosphate plus energy plus a phosphate group leads to this energy packet that's required in the microorganisms and in the biological cell in the form of ATP. Substrate level phosphorylation is the transfer of high energy phosphate to ATP and again you'll see phosphate being the high energy compound binding with the carbon chains to form ATP. Now in the generation of ATP there are several mechanisms that are involved in this. Energy is released by the transfer of electrons. This is the oxidation portion of one compound to another which is the reduction aspect and then generated ATP. This is referred to as chemiosmosis. Light basically causes chlorophyll to give up electrons and energy that's released from the transfer of electrons, oxidation, and the chlorophyll through this system or carrier molecules will be used to generate ATP. So again two different systems that you're looking at there. Again in the biological system
um, we see the generation of uh, ATP basically through uh, this process of the Krebs cycle and then in organisms uh, that, obtain, that hold on to chlorophyll, that use chlorophyll uh, to exchange energy, we'll see the generation uh, through the electron transport chain. Now, metabolic pathways for energy production. Metabolic pathways for energy pr production. A sequence of enzymatically catalyzed chemical reactions in a cell is referred to as a metabolic pathway. The primary example we use that fits that definition is ATP, the production of ATP in the Krebs cycle. The other name for the Krebs cycle is the citric acid cycle, so you may see uh, your textbook may refer to uh, both of those uh, uh, pathways. Such a pathway necessary to extract energy from organic compounds. They allow energy to be released in a controlled manner instead of damaging bursts of energy that typically would produce a significant amount of heat. Heat again can destabilize enzymes if you remember, so this has to be a controlled sequence of enzymatic reactions that will uh, allow these reactions to take place in an orderly manner. Now, the breakdown of carbohydrates to release energy occurs inside the cell or inside microorganisms in a series of enzymatic reactions. Each series of reactions has a different name and causes a different set of sequences or different set of substrates and products to be produced. And so we'll review those for each of the major carb uh, carbon-based substances that we'll see in the system. The breakdown of carbohydrates, which typically refers to six carbon um, structures, basically involves two enzymatic uh, events, one of which is referred to as glycolysis. Glycolysis is typically the breakdown of these six carbon structures into three carbon structures. Now, when the substance is broken into a three carbon structure that's inside the cytoplasm, then the three carbon structures are allowed to move into the mitochondria. Mitochondria, small organelle inside the cell, inside the microorganism. And so the three carbon structures are allowed to move inside the mitochondria where it will then go through this Krebs cycle. Again, another series of enzymatic steps that will produce the final byproduct, which would be energy in the form of ATP. Then in structures that have chlorophyll, we'll see another sequence of events referred to as the electron transport chain, again, where electrons are used to be able to generate energy components. So again, each of those are a series, a sequence of enzymatic reactions that will take place. For glycolysis, it is the oxidation of glucose into a three carbon compound, peruvic acid, that produces, eventually will produce, ATP and NADH. Uh, so again, oxidation of glucose, oxidation of glucose takes place in the cytoplasm, inside the cell, produces a three carbon sugar referred to as peruvic acid, and then peruvic acid is then taken across the mitochondrial membrane, because it's a membranous organelle, into the mitochondria and a series of enzymatic steps will occur then in the form of the Krebs cycle to produce ATP and NADH. Six carbon sugar glucose plays a central role in carbohydrate metabolism. Glucose is usually broken down into pyruvic acid by glycolysis. Glycolysis means splitting of sugar, which is the first stage of both fermentation reactions and in respiration reactions. Our system works by respiration reactions We'll talk about fermentation reactions in just a little bit. Glycolysis, also known as the ebden marinhoff pathway, is basically a series of chemical reactions. These chemical reactions take place in the cytoplasm, in the cytosol, in the human system. Uh, and again, six carbon sugars will be broken into three carbon components. The main point are that six carbon molecules are split form two molecules of peruvic acid. Each molecule has three carbons. Two molecules of ATP will be needed or were needed to start this reaction to take place. So to get energy, we got to use energy. And this is why energy production is so important inside microorganisms and inside the human system 
it requires energy to make these reactions take place. Because these reactions take place, they generate more energy on the other end. So two molecules of ATP needed to start the reaction. Four molecules of ATP are formed by substrate level phosphorylation, substrate and also phosphorylation, remember adenophosphate generates energy. The net yield basically is two ATP molecules. Now, an alternative pathway that's used by some systems is referred to as the pentose phosphate pathway or the hexomonophosphate shunt. This is basically another sequence of enzymatic reactions that take place. Again, the ultimate goal is to help produce energy. It produces intermediates pentoses or five carbon sugars that act as precursors in the synthesis of nucleic acid, certain amino acids, and glucose from carbon dioxide photosynthesizing organisms use this structure. Now remember we use oxygen but now we're getting glucose from carbon dioxide by photosynthesizing uh, organisms or microorganisms. Uh, the pathway, uh, Edendemmerhoff pathway or EDP, this is another way to oxidize glucose into peruvic acid. Remember, oxidizing glucose into peruvic acid, the goal is so now the carbon structures can get on the inside of the mitochondria to be able to produce ATP. If these structures don't get inside the mitochondria, it can't go through these enzymatic pathways that are required to be able to generate more ATP. Bacteria, typically gram-negative bacteria, which I may have alluded to in a previous lecture, gram-negative uh, bacteria that utilize this pathway can metabolize without either glycolysis or the pentose phosphate uh, pathway. That's important in microorganisms when you see their ability to utilize other pathways to generate energy gives them or can affect their virulence. Uh, ability, their ability to cause disease but th because they can use these alternative pathways. This pathway also yields NAD and ADPH from glucose which may be used in biosynthetic reactions uh, as well. Now for our system, for the human system, we basically look at respiration as the important factor in being able to produce additional energy. These reactions that involve respiration obviously take place in the presence of oxygen. O2 has to be in the mix. So respiration is an ATP generating process in which molecules are basically oxidized and a final electron acceptor is almost always an inorganic molecule. Organic molecules carbon based. Inorganic molecules are what are used as the final electron acceptor in this case. In aerobic respiration the final electron acceptor is basically oxygen. And the anaerobic reception or respiration, it is usually an inorganic molecule other than a molecule of oxygen that's being used. So in the preparatory sta sta stage, again, this illustration is out of your book, two ATPs are used. Glucose is split to form two glucose, three phosphate, which is basically three carbon sugars. In the preparatory phase, Again, this illustration is taken out of your textbook to be able to show the initial steps in these types of reactions that will produce uh, the peruvic acid. Now, I'm not going to ask you neither for glycolysis nor for the Krebs cycle nor for the EDF uh, uh, pathway. I'm not going to ask you to go through these enzymatic steps. I would expect you to recognize which pathways are associated with a particular microorganism, as I alluded to earlier for gram-negative organisms, for the human system, for example, we use this process of glycolysis, ATP in the mitochondria, in structures or microorganisms that utilize chlorophyll, they use the electron transport chain. So I would expect you to understand that relationship, but I'm not going to ask you to mark out enzymatic steps um, in this process. Again, I want you to have a general knowledge. I want you to appreciate 
also and I'll digress here again for a second and like well why do we have to hear all this stuff because that's not what it's about we're looking at diseases microorganisms that cause the diseases because when we talk about the microorganisms that causes diseases we'll talk about the treatments that are involved in stopping the growth of microorganisms we'll go through there will be some chapters where we go through some historical data and then we'll understand why these uh, mechanisms that were used back in the 16, 17, 1800s, why they worked. Scientists at that time didn't really understand why they worked. We do now. Think about uh, 100 years from now, what scientists will be able to understand about what we were doing now. But the reason why you learn this is because we need to know how can we affect the growth of microorganisms. How can we stop microorganisms that cause disease? How can we stop them from growing? Well, if we attack their energy source, if we stop the electron transport chain in certain microorganisms, if we stop glycolysis or if we stop the Krebs cycle or the citric acid cycle from being able to function either by breaking the enzymatic steps, affecting the coenzymes or cofactors that are involved, then we in essence will stop energy production, kill the microorganism, and um, we will be able to survive and hopefully will kill more of the bad guys than they kill us doesn't always work like that but we'll see so in the steps of glycolysis again glycolysis taking place I'm sorry I skipped there glycolysis again taking place inside the um, uh, glycolysis again taking place uh, inside the cytosol glycolysis after it occurs breaks the six carbon sugar glucose for example into a three carbon sugar which moves into the mitochondria where uh, ATP, I'm sorry, where uh, the Krebs cycle will, will take place at that point. Um, and then when we look at the pentose phosphate pathway, again in a review, five carbon sugars in NAD operates with glycolysis. We also talked about the EDP pathway produces NAD, uh, pH, and ATP. It does not involve glycolysis. Certain microorganisms use this pathway organisms that we'll talk about and some of you who've already done some of your labs